Kia ora koutou, life and well-being to you all. Ko Ngāti Kuhungunu ki Wairarapa, ko Ngāti Pro, ko Kai Tahu Okoiwi. These are the tribes that I have birth heritage connections to, which spanned the east coast of the North Island and some of the South Island of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Ko J. Mātanga toko ngoa, uh, ngoa. My name is J. Mātanga, and I am the director of the Global Witness Department for the World Evangelical Alliance and the executive director of the Mission Commission, which sits within the WEA's Global Witness Department. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou kato. Three times greetings to you all, very respected people in the Māori tongue of my forefathers. Te Muriora. This is the vital life force. And today we are reminded that the vital life force comes from the only true God as we read this passage from 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 to 13 in the NLT. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews and some are Gentiles. Some are Ghanaians, some are Costa Ricans, some are Maori, some are German, some are Russian, some are Ukrainian. And we could go on and on and on. But returning to the scriptures, some are slaves and some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit. And we all share, that is, drink from or are watered by or soaked in the same spirit. End quote. With a little paraphrasing. We are all one in the same spirit. We are indivisibly connected. We are a singular body of Christ made up of many parts. Well, it wasn't intended this way, but 1 Corinthians 12 has become the word of God for this conference. Let's celebrate this. It was completely unarranged, but this passage has been referred to regularly over the past couple of sessions. The Spirit of God is speaking to us as brothers and sisters through our brothers and sisters. We are so different, yet we are one. Well, I present here before you as one who is indigenous to Aotearoa, New Zealand. I am Māori by my father's line, whose father, my paternal grandfather, had only Māori heritage. As a Māori, I identify as an evangelical Christian, since I hold strongly to a biblical, allegiant and activistic faith. Allegiant in the sense that I follow the crucified and resurrected Christ as Lord and experience God by the enabling of the Holy Spirit given to those who follow Christ. Activism is simply the living out of my faith in this world of broken relationships that we inhabit, wherever the Holy Spirit leads us to live. Well, it's my great privilege to be able to touch on the issues of indigeneity with you today, with a particular focus on the implications of an indigenous perspective for missions. In its technical use, uh, indigenous means of the land or environment. And it usually refers to First Nations or pre-colonial peoples. But for those who haven't heard me speak on this before, I use the term indigenous to mean much more than just the technical or United Nations meaning. I extend the meaning to encompass all collectivist oriented people uh, in the world because we, we share so many life values and ways of knowing in common. I use indigenous to counterpoint the industrial world. And by industrial, um, industrial, I mean ways of knowing that have emerged out of European enlightenment and Eurocentric Christianity. If it helps, I use indigenous to more or less refer to the majority world and industrial to refer to the West. Although there's significant overlap between these two systems or ways of knowing, you can have urban and educated people living in cities within otherwise indigenous geographies. People who have adapted to industrial ways of knowing. And you can have indigenous knowing people migrating into industrial contexts. So used in this way, indigenous and industrial helps us avoid categorizing people from some or by some random geography. For instance, Global South makes absolutely no sense to us who live down under, or some constructed economic block like First World, Second World, Third World. 
Indigenous and industrial focuses more on the broad spectrum values and ways of knowing and interacting with the world of big blocks of people. I see these as two great knowledge ecosystems with overlapping areas of interaction and tension. When we experience a clash of ways of knowing, I argue that we should view the tensions as opportunities for maturity. And I use the musical term counterpoint deliberately to help us realize that our objective should be to strive for harmony by allowing multiple voices to sing the different melodies to the same beat or rhythm. Sometimes the industrial voice is clearly heard, but other times the indigenous voice needs to bring a counterpoint in melody. Sometimes we need to highlight the gaps in the industrial melody and amplify the indigenous voice in order to establish an effective counterpoint harmony. Because only when matched together in the unforced rhythms of grace do we create harmony. Did you know that harmony does not come from resolution? There's so much talk today about resolving things, but it is a pipe dream. Have you ever considered that? Rather than resolving the tension, harmony comes from holding the tension. Well, as any stringed instrument player knows, you cannot hit a harmonic note without tuned tension. I'll show you. <laughs> this is a harmonic. Now, if I was to slacken this off, what do we get? We do not get a harmonic. We can't slacken it off. And so it is really with the body of Christ. We grow under the tensions of our differences. For as we persevere in our differences, bearing one another's burdens, holding to the faith, but surrendering our privileges and our preferences in mutual loving kindness and seeking perpetually reconciled relationships, we will be made perfect, lacking nothing. Or so the Apostle James promises us. And by perfection, he means maturity. Well, for more than 240 years, Protestant missionary endeavor has been dominated by an industrial perspective, strongly influenced by a European colonial paradigm. Since World War II, the European colonial paradigm has been waning and the global context, context has been changing. In my estimation, traditional missions, uh, or at least traditional missions mindsets, are no longer fit for purpose. We're now in an era where indigenous ways of knowing are influencing the global church and global missions. See, the World Christian Encyclopedia Statistics uh, with Todd Johnson and Gina Serlo, they, they show us the global church is indigenous more than it is industrial. And since the last decades of the 20th century, we know global missions has been coming more indigenous as majority world Christianity climbed into the middle class, which is typically the economic strata that makes trans-border missions, at least, uh, plausible and accessible. What are some of the implications of a shift towards an indigenous future for the church and missions? To answer that, first let me try to concretize some of the differences between indigenous and industrial for you, because therein lie the implications for missions particularly. This is obviously oversimplified, but it is far from simplistic. For industrial ways of knowing, relational expectations develop contractually, typically. They're transactional and usually productivity or outcome oriented. Word pictures like team and partnership are used which assume autonomous agents in collaboration within some form of atomized or disconnected world. Groups that are formed and dominated by this individualistic perspective hold together because of a common aim or objective typically. 
group cohesion is dependent on a goal or outcome. Collaborative relationships revolve around applying one's resources to the achievement of a task and the individual or organizational contributor retains ownership of the resources. And the, retu- the reward or return on investment is either individually or organizationally meritous. There has to be a bang for a buck. In trying to mitigate the destruction that industrialization has caused to our habitats, a lot of the talk in the industrial world is around sustainability. By that, they effectively mean to enable uh, continued consumption. A concept growing in popularity, especially amongst Christians in the climate change and creation care space, um, is that of stewardship which is not wrong, but it tends to have underlying assumptions of control. As a counterpoint to this, indigenous ways of knowing are more interconnected and spiritually aware. Indigenous have a collective understanding of reality where the social agreement is more covenantal than contractual. Relationships are mutual, reciprocal and familial. The outcome is less important than the relationship enhancing processes that are undertaken along the way. Sharing is more important than acquisition. Very little is individually possessed or held on to. And nothing, nothing is autonomous. Everything is interrelated and affected by human agency. At best... You know, in a perfect world, the indigenous seek to honour and value and give toward the common good without much thought of direct return. When faced with the broken universe around us, we, we seek vitality to promote life in all things fostered by reciprocity. A prevailing image for creation care, therefore, and in life in general, is that of guardianship, where the underlying motivation is that of of protection and mutual growth. And this is obviously somewhat idealized, but both industrial and indigenous people should recognize the the values there that they identify with or hold um, more or less in common with with that um, ecosystem, even if they're a little bit aspirational, especially for the indigenous. But for those with ears to hear, you might sense that our missions, visions, strategies and activities are firmly aligned within the industrial paradigm. Yet frustration is rising and we have and we will hear it again in this conference that the indigenous influence needs to emerge as a true counterpoint in our global missions practice and conversations. Without it, we will not mature as a global missions community, or a global church for that matter. One of the most significant implications for missions, if we enable the indigenous counterpoint to lead us forward in the song, is that we ought to have a far deeper appreciation for the role of honour in our co-labouring for gospel growth. Again, that has already come up uh, th- in this conference, it's come through strongly, but please hear me. I said honour, not honour and shame. I'm not referring to the way certain folk from an industrial perspective have characterised one of the most foundational attributes of our Indigenous experience. To tag shame onto honour as some do is highly reductionistic and quite frankly, I feel it dishonours us. When I speak of honour, I mean that we seek to lift up the dignity of others. One of the most effective ways to elevate dignity is to acknowledge the other's authority. We see this throughout Jesus' ministry, and especially his canotic final act, where he did not consider his privileges as God something to be wielded as influence over others, but he laid them aside and he became a servant, as Paul writes in Philippians 2. Jesus let the rich young man leave. He asked the, the, the uh, crippled man if he wanted to get well. He invites us to follow him. But Jesus never opposes his will upon us. God honours us and acknowledges our will, our authority. In the Pacific, we refer to this as mana. As I've said elsewhere, I believe missions needs to centre the local. 
we need to recognize that those who receive the gospel become guardians of the gospel for their people. And we need to give them room and time and resources to help them grow. It's an organic process or a spiritually organic process for them to grow at the pace of the Holy Spirit. As my brother from another mother, Fred D'Amato, illustrated yesterday, we need to allow them to take the center and dance to their own beat. As outsiders then, we should adapt our moves to the locals and then dance, but on the periphery. There is a fair bit of talking in missions at the moment about something called polycentrism. It was the theme of the Mission Commission's 2016 Global Consultation in Panama, and it will be the theme of Lausanne 2024, more or less, um, in Korea. It is a term from the realms of industrial political sciences. Someone in missions has suggested it means from everywhere to everywhere, but it does not. It means multiple centres of authority within a larger system. It means centering the local. This is what indigenous peoples have always known. We live within circles of honour, which overlap and interact with other circles of honour, which all together make up an entire system. Whether it is a larger tribe of sub-tribes or a large geographic region of interconnected tribes like we have across the great highway of the Pacific Ocean, throughout Africa, or up and down the Americas, indigenous peoples have always been polycentric, honouring and respecting other tribes' authorities. Well, ideally, anyway, we can talk about dishonour another time. Honouring the authority of the local means that we share our lives with mutual reciprocity wherever the Lord leads us to live our Christ-like lives. Openly with our neighbours, being ready to explain our faith whenever questions arise. It is invitational rather than impositional. Living attractively and waiting for an invitation to share Jesus. It's not passive. Our loving kindness should be powerfully active for the benefit of others and our habitats. But being uh, waiting for the invitation honours the will of our neighbours. And in this way, the word of our testimony, that is our lived experience of God and our learning about God, it is seeded. And when that seed takes root, well, we know well the parable and look forward to seeing the rapid multiplication produced from the seed that falls into fertile soil. As our brother Dave will illustrate in a moment, in some parts of the world this is happening at an astounding rate as indigenous movements multiply. Justin Long, uh, working with Dave Coles in the Mission Agency Beyond, he estimates with some really good uh, research behind it, that 1% of the global population now follow Christ as part of an indigenous people movement. Do the calculation, that's almost 80 million new believers in Christ out of another major religious group, just in the past decades. There are those who would sit in judgment and dispute the authenticity of these believers. But a lot of the criticism rests on what I call a commitment to a Eurocentric theological consensus. The critics are sitting with a false sense of superior judgment over a biblically authentic experience of Christ that is emerging from these new indigenous centers of authority. The days, quite frankly, of the Eurocentric theological consensus being able to impose their theological perspective upon the rest of the global church are done. They're over. I'm not suggesting for a second that foundational Christian orthodoxy is dismissed. But I am suggesting that the experience of indigenous followers of the Jesus way will discover new biblically authentic perspectives about God and the kingdom of our Lord to share with us all and to mature us all as we interact globally as sojourners and co-learners with one another. That is, if we honour the local. We recognise their authority as guardians of the gospel for themselves and allow their voices to rise in counterpoint harmony with more established expressions of our faith. Holding the tension, for it is there that the Spirit of God is doing a new thing. Yes, we are all part of one body. The body is held together in tension. We belong together. 
and we strengthen each other. Industrial parts cannot say to the indigenous parts, I've no use for you. And the indigenous parts cannot separate themselves from the industrial parts. In Christ, we are immersed and enlivened by the same spirit and we will mature each other. Well, Rohanui ya koto e haere ana ki te ao. Much love to you all as you go into your worlds. Thank you and God bless you abundantly. Amen. <laughs>